come too many times to Barcelona. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely city, and I was sitting in the sunshine today, enjoying it, and I'm very jealous of people who live here. Um, I hope, from what Ricardo said about regulation, that you won't find some duplication at the end of this lecture, um, but we'll see how we get on. Um, just by way of introduction, um, the word children is in the title, and when I say children, I do mean children, not youth. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff out there that is very vague about, you know, do they mean children, young people, youth? And sometimes you find that people, when they say youth, they mean up to 35. Well, that's not what I mean. I mean under 18. And actually, when you're talking about children's television, um, teenagers very often watch adult TV. So if we say children's television, we're referring to pre-teenage, 12 years and under. And that, from the production side, tends to be split between preschool and what they call tweens, the children who are between um, preschool and teenage. Um, and the other clarification is when I say med in the Euromed here, I'm talking about the Arab Mediterranean because I don't really know anything about Turkey or Turkish media or Israeli media. My specialization is Arab media, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Okay, so <clears throat> the heading on this slide, it shows the titles of two children's shows that demonstrate the potential success of content for young children that crosses borders. <clears throat> so if you think you know, you're crossing borders, there's a change of language. You run into problems of dubbing, subtitling. Subtitling is problematic with young children. Now these series, the ones referred to here, were deliberately international. That was the whole point of them, to exchange and share the content among broadcasters across borders. I'm giving you these examples, but neither, was, neither series was either specifically European or Mediterranean. And I'm going to show the clips in a minute, but before I do that, let me just give you a bit of background to the lecture. Um, okay, when I was invited, I chose to focus on screen content for children because for nearly three years now, a team of us at the University of Westminster have been researching screen media for children who speak Arabic. The team um, of researchers was five people. So we had two, a colleague and myself, looking at the political economy of production and distribution. We had one, a PhD student, whose work I'll refer to later, who um, had her studentship as part of the project, and her topic was how children are defined and addressed in Arab uh, media. And then we had two people researching child audiences, and they were doing it in a qualitative, ethnographic way. <coughs> the audience research took place with children of Arab families in London and in two Mediterranean cities, Casablanca and Beirut. And the Beirut, as you can imagine, was quite problematic because bombings in the last two years and all sorts of upsets and unrest, but nevertheless, our wonderful researchers managed to do it. And that research with young child audiences showed that children, even the youngest, regardless of their social background, are very good at finding what they want on any kind of screen device. It also showed that there is really not much content, local content, that appeals to them. Now, that's the audience side. When it came to the production side and the distribution, we had to follow the funding. And the funding took us to the Gulf, to countries like Qatar, where they have Al Jazeera children's uh, television, uh, um, to Abu Dhabi, 
and to Dubai. In Egypt, which was active in children's media at one stage, production for children pretty much collapsed after the revolution in 2011, and it's still very weak. So the point I want to make, the first two points on this slide, is that what we see is that where co-production exists, um, it's mostly US financed. So the Sesame Street productions in Egypt, Palestine, Jordan, all of which are more or less ceased now, um, and except there's a new one being made in Abu Dhabi. Whereas co-production with European partners um, has mostly been in the Gulf and only very rarely in the Arab Mediterranean. Now, that may not be surprising until you remember, well, probably you're all too young to remember, but people of my generation remember that projects like, um, you know, uh, Euromed media projects go back a long way. So I remember in 1993 a project called Med Media. And I remember Euromed audio, Audiovisual, which is part of the collaboration that goes back to the Barcelona Declaration of 1995, and we are in Barcelona. Um, and yes, I mean, I did find a few examples of Euromed collaboration for children's content supported by Annalint Foundation, but I think it's fair to say that such collaboration is pretty rare. But if we look at the current political situation, with huge population flows from the southern shores of the Mediterranean to uh, northern Europe, including large numbers of children, and we see that every day on our television screens, you know, you would think that there is an urgent need for that kind of programming. But when you look at the economics of program making, you see very unfavorable trends. And I'm going to come back to those unfavorable trends, but let me just show you examples of the programs that I've mentioned, just so you can get a flavor um, of what's been made in the past. They were both made um, by <clears throat> a UK company called Ragdoll Productions, which was founded in the 1980s by a woman called Anne Wood. Now, please note, I did not choose these examples because Ragdoll is a British company. I'm not that nationalistic at all. Or, and I also didn't choose it, because Ragdoll, I mean, I don't know how well you know your kind of media production, but Ragdoll Productions is pretty big in children's media. So if you've heard of Teletubbies, and I believe it is called Teletubbies in Spain as well, that's Ragdoll Productions. The reason I chose these clips is that Anne Wood came and spoke at our university uh, exactly a year ago at a symposium. Um, and she spoke very honestly about the constraints on making children's content today. So let me show you the clips now, and then afterwards I'll tell you what she said. The first clip is from a series called um, Open a Door. Now, these are five minutes, it's from a series of films that are five minutes, no longer than five minutes. They have no conversation, and they are seen from daily life from a child's point of view. The series started back in 1992. By 1999, there were 15 countries taking part in making and exchanging uh, these films. And then that number more than doubled to 34 over the next few years. And in 2002, Nickelodeon joined in. So, you know, a rare example of a, of a, a giant kind of joining into something that is small, uh, started small. This shot, this clip, is shot in Chile. And it's about a child called Anita. And we just have one minute, 20 seconds of it, yeah.
Mr. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I love that because, you know, the surprise of realizing how high up they are. I don't know if you could see because the light wasn't very good. The, did you see the, 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 the extreme altitude? And they were coming down all these steps and then took the funicular. And I don't know, it's a, I, I don't know how a child would see that, but I think it's quite, you know, impressive. Anne Wood said about Open a Door, she said, I couldn't do it now because indies, and that's what we call independent production companies, indies are not open to experimentation now. The climate is all about corporate money making. Now we have a clip from um, a, the show What Makes Me Happy. And this episode is about Mahmoud, who lives in Palestine. The whole film here is just over 10 minutes, but I'm only going to show you the same length of time. We go up to like 1 minute 47. Um, please. Smile or laugh or jump for joy. What makes you happy? Okay, so as you can imagine, um, what makes Mahmoud happy is having a place to be by himself and to do what he wants to do. And at the end of the film, you see him on the rooftop drawing. Uh, because most of the time, the only voices you hear during the action is Mahmoud, Mahmoud, when his extended family are calling on him to do lots of chores and errands. Um, and Rag Doll Productions uh, worked, when they made that film, they worked with local directors and the communities and the children themselves. Um, <clears throat> so each film in the series, they would have a director stay for two weeks, you know, in, in the country, talking to older children to find out what they remembered made them happy when they were younger. And Anne Wood gave examples of how those programs worked cross-culturally. So she gave an example of a Sudanese program um, about children who were supposed to be guarding cattle and they lost the cattle and they were afraid to go home and tell their parents and they were happy when the cattle came back. Um, <clears throat> but she said, you know, children in Birmingham in the UK, very far away from guarding cattle, had been captivated by the story because that thing about being scared to tell something to your parents, you know, it's a universal theme and kids relate to that wherever they are. But then she talked about the potential pitfalls of trying to make that kind of cross-cultural program because she said that adults, you know, they want to use it as a kind of tourism advertisement. Um, the NGOs that are there want to focus on the misery, not what makes the child happy. And you end up without child, children's voices not being heard. So, you, you know, you need the skill of the storyteller. And I think it's worth mentioning that Anne Wood, um, 
and I'm going to stop talking about her in a minute, um, but she believes <clears throat> that TV is still an important way of delivering content to children because it cuts through the differences of social class and it shows, because we're talking broadcast, yeah, it shows children things that they might not otherwise see. So I want to use <clears throat> that backdrop of those divergent trends and pressures to offer some data in this lecture. And I'll do that in the following order. Um, first, in order to select data and interpret it, I need to tell you what is my theoretical framework. Um, and then I have divided my examples into kind of three groups of practices, which I summarize as production, co-production, promotion through things like prizes, festivals, training, and so on. And then thirdly, and this is where I said that I hope there won't be duplication, I have to talk a bit about regulation. Reaching consensus on norms of how to ensure that children get the best from screen media. So if we look at the first line of uh, examples, um, I'm going to be talking about schemes for co-production that are called item exchange. That's where um, producers from different countries make a program and contribute it to a shared collection so that all the broadcasters who are taking part in the scheme can show all the programs in the collection. And it's called Make One Take All. And it's kind of, for the broadcasters, it should be economic way of getting good content. When I talk about this, I'm going to focus um, on document, making documentaries. Then the second um, set of examples um, is about collaboration in the form of festivals, where there's prizes for good content and training to help the good content get made. And then thirdly, um, you know, grown-ups often have very firm ideas about what's good for children. So, how much Euromed collaboration is there really vis-a-vis -vis regulating television for children's benefit? And then I will come to some kind of conclusion. Um, <clears throat> so, in order to reach a conclusion, um, I need to think about what am I looking for in the data? And clearly, there are lots of players with potential roles in Euromed collaboration over screens, uh, screen content for children. I've just mentioned some. I mentioned private production companies, non-governmental organizations, individual directors and producers, children themselves, and then there are the public broadcasters and their production units, international organizations that bring those broadcasters together, and so on. And there are also the pressures and influences that I mentioned, which is why I quoted Anne Wood, to give you a kind of hands-on, day-to-day perception of those pressures and influences. How you know, do you grapple, as a researcher, how do you grapple with all these players and factors? And so my suggestion is one way to think about them is as part of an ecosystem or an ecology. And for that, I refer to Simon Cottle, who used the term ecology in his edited collection, Media Organization and Production, that came out in 2003. And Cottle builds on Bourdieu's idea of the cultural field, which Bourdieu wrote about in the 1980s, and I'm sure you've come across. And when Bourdieu uses the term field, he uses it in the sense of a field of forces and a field of struggles. So the notion is centered on relationality. So when Cottle uses the term ecology, it's not just about players, not just about practices, not just about relationships, but it's about all of these and the dynamics between them. So ecology similar to the idea of an ecosystem, gives us the possibility of understanding organizational relationships and practices within fields of media production, as well as the individuals and organizations in them. So we can get a sense of internal factors that influence media outputs, and we also get a sense of external factors 
the factors that are external to individuals and entities. And in the Euromed landscape, um, I've tried to indicate some of the complexity of that ecosystem in this diagram. Um, so I've divided it up. We have uh, national state actors and national non-state actors. We have international state actors and international non-state actors. And some of the names that you see here will come up as I go through the data, and I am sure that this audience, being who you are, are already very familiar with most of the acronyms. Uh, EBU, down the bottom left, stands for European Broadcasting Union. Yes, it's European, but actually the EBU members include several Arab state broadcasters, including those of Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, and Morocco. And the EBU is open to non-state broadcasters too, which is why I put it in the non-state category, Be because like that also, it has potential for ideas to be exchanged between and among state and non-state actors. COPEAM, I'm sure you also know, stands for the Permanent Conference of Mediterranean Audiovisual Operators in the French version, Co Conférence Permanente de something or other. Um, and this is in the non-state category for the same reason as the EBU, with the same potential for ideas exchange among public and private players. Again, we have Arab membership. Jordan and Egypt were among the founding members. And Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Palestine, Lebanon all belong to COPEAM. And then on the right-hand side, the international state actors, ASBU, I'm sure you know, Arab States Broadcasting Union based in Tunis, primarily intergovernmental, um, being mostly made up of uh, state broadcasters. And then an Alint Foundation. I've put it in both categories because the whole point about Annalint is that it is a network of governmental and non-governmental players from 42 countries. And then the MNRA, also known as RIRM, the Réseau des Instances Régulatoires Méditerranéen, or, easier for me to say, Mediterranean Network of Regulatory Authorities. Um, I placed it with the state actors because regulators act with the authority of the state. And the network is open to any independent regulatory authority in the Mediterranean that is willing to take part in its activities and exchanges. And it currently has 24 member authorities. And I'm going to come to that when I talk about sharing regulatory norms. So let's start off with the first um, set of examples, um, <clears throat> which have to do with shared production. And I want to start with the, with the kind of general issues. And I've classified these under two main headings, simplified into money and values. <clears throat> and the material I'm going to discuss here um, relates to the EBU item exchange for documentaries for children in the age range 8 to 12 or 10 to 12. And I could have played you a clip, but I don't want to risk taking more, of my, more time than, um, than we might have. So um, you can imagine. I mean, it's um, one of the, 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 the um, films in the series starts with um, a young girl on a speedboat, you know, like zooming up a river, and it is, you know, it's really exciting. Um, now, I've put money as a first issue because money puts a dampener on any project. Partly because of the economic pressures in European Union countries, which causes cuts in the funding for this kind of collaborative work, but also partly because um, a number of countries that sign up for the item exchange with the EBU neglect to pay. They sign up and they're supposed to pay. They're supposed to pay a contribution to a central budget to cover the costs of 
the executive producer and EBU administration and coordination. And it quite often happens that they sign up and then at the end they ne that payment doesn't come. Now, there's reasons for that, right? Um, so being motivated to pay depends on who is directly involved in the exchange. And this varies from country to country. In some countries, the person involved is the head of children's programs, which may seem perfectly normal. But in others, it's the head of something called the Department for International Cooperation. So the person who is head of the International Cooperation Department then has to persuade the director of programs to actually screen the films to which the, the broadcaster has become entitled because they've made one of their own. And that's not always as easy as you might think because there may be issues about actually what are in some of the films that, have been, um, that are part of the exchange. And it can, that indecision... Uh, can lead to questions about payment and non-payment. Who, for example, is going to pay for the subtitling? You know, is it the broadcaster themselves that is strapped for cash in a under you know, in a in a, in a in a in a country where they're kind of you know struggling to to pay for the public broadcaster? But if you've got no sub subtitling, how do you exchange? Um, and the internal politics inside broadcasters can cause a bottleneck here. The second major heading here is values. And the first set of values are those that relate to children because not all cultures are child-centered. And it's not part of ordinary practice in some places to make a, a documentary about an ordinary child. So I was told examples of countries, and you will see these are not Arab countries, um, where you know the broadcaster wants to profile a very special child, a child that has won an award, you know, their national ice skater, for example. Um, so, but the point about the program is it's supposed to be about ordinary children. And then there are production values. Now, TV content, needs drama you know you'd look at any program that succeeds and you will find that there's drama in it even if it's not called drama even if it's reality tv or some kind of you know quiz show or whatever it's designed to have drama so in these programs it's the unfolding drama of a child's life and if a piece is not exciting and not watchable by all children it's not going to be selected and that, you know, when you have everybody sitting around looking at each other's programs, deciding, will I have this one or not? If programs are not selected, that's very embarrassing for those who made it, for the executive producer, and so on. Now, <clears throat> I'll give examples of these issues in action. Um, examples in... Um, Jordanian and Egyptian involvement in the European um, Broadcasting Union documentary exchange to show how misunderstandings um, can arise. So, um, for both the Jordanian and Egyptian um, uh, participants, the, the, it was the state broadcaster involved. So, in Jordan, that is... Jordanian radio and television, JRTV. They were involved from 2002 to 2005. Uh, in Egypt, it's the Egyptian Radio and Television Union, ERTU, who was involved from 2005 to 2008. Now, the broadcast documentaries had to be 15 minutes long. And I don't know how many people here have experience of making films, but that is a jolly long time to make uh, good stuff. Um, in the slide here, I've shown, and you can tell who they are. There's a European boy, an Egyptian girl, and a Jordanian boy um, from Bedouin community. And I chose them to illustrate some of the anecdotes that I was told 
And I was told them by a European side um, uh, from the EBU experience. But I want to try and like um, express them, not in any kind of like critical or judgmental way, but just a, a way that demonstrates you know, how when you're talking cross-cultural programming, how difficult it is to agree and come to a consensus. So, in the first film that JRTV um, made for the item exchange, they chose to show, show a boy with serious physical disability who was attending um, a special school and trying to integrate in society. How did they do that? Well, they interviewed six adults who had helped with the school. The boy himself got to speak for just 30 seconds at the end of the program, saying his name and making a plea to the people who watched the program to look beyond his disability. Now, that didn't work for the item exchange because the whole point of the series was for the child to tell his own story, but also making that plea about um, disability went completely against the kind of diversity policies of many European partners in the exchange for whom, you know, disability is like incorporated into norms of everyday life. Um, in another JRTV film, um, and there was um, a local objection um, to showing the child's mother or sisters on screen. So this was a film made in a Bedouin community with a child who'd been taking, who was taking care of camels. And in the end, the, mother, the child's mother did appear in the film for just a few seconds, but only after the Jordanian producers, who were not themselves Bedouin, had paid extra to the Bedouin family for appearing in the film. With the third film that they made, um, the local Jordanian team had learned a lot from the previous experiences, and their third film was much more kind of empowering in the way that the, under, uh, the Europeans understood it. And this was called The Breadwinner. It was about a, a girl, 12 years old, who helps her father, who's a fisherman, who's had an accident and can't do the work that's needed, so she helps him. And the Jordanian producers made it exciting. They arranged for under, underwater camera work to show the girl diving in. She's wearing a headscarf, etc., but she dives into the water to untangle the fishing tackle. Um, and that, from the EBU point of view, they, they, that, that film worked. And they were impressed, you know, about the sort of underwater camera equipment, etc. But it's not always the answer to use high-tech equipment. So one of the European producers that I spoke to remembers counterparts in Egypt using a jib for a documentary about a child. Now, a jib is um, a boom device with a camera on the end that you use for taking high-angle shots. Um, imagine a child a young child, surrounded by a camera crew and production team, you know, with sort of clapperboards and massive equipment. And the child is expected to be natural. Um, there will be differences of opinion about the aesthetic of the cinematography between different countries uh, involved in the item exchange. So that idea of, you know, the sort of the grammar of documentary making it differs according to <clears throat> who's making the film. But then differences in child rearing are also at play. So the ERTU, the Egyptian um, produce, uh, team, uh, made a film about a boy who ran away from home because his father beat him. That can happen anywhere. But the ERTU film featured a reconciliation scene where the boy apologizes to his father for annoying him and causing the father to beat him. 
Now, you know, I, then you can, you know, sort of cultural differences arise again. Um, <clears throat> the issues of the EBU exchange I mentioned were mostly about perceptions of children, child rearing, ways of filming children. But here I want to focus briefly on another item exchange. This time it was between the Arab States Broadcasting Union and COPEAM, the Conference of Mediterranean Broadcasters. And here the issues arising are about the making of films as such, not necessarily about films for children. The series in question was the second in the Interrive between the banks um, project of the, between the shores, I suppose we should say, Rive, um, project of Euro Arab co uh, production uh, organized by ASBO and COPIAM. And the first series, um, the first series in, the, in that um, project created 32 programs of 13 minutes each, and they were about um, art, women, migrants, and so on. And some of these were shown on both sides of the Mediterranean, in Italy, Spain, Greece, Egypt, and Algeria. Now, when it came to the second series, they focused on children, and they called the, that series Glances of Children. And again, the films were 13 minutes each. And the, broadcasting, uh, the broadcasters taking part came from Malta, San Marino, Italy, Spain. And on the southern Mediterranean side, you had Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Morocco, Algeria. And you also had um, JCC, Al Jazeera Children's Channel, because they belong to, because Al Jazeera is a relationship with um, ASPU, ASPU. And 17 documentaries were produced. Now, <clears throat> I looked at the um, kind of official documentation about this series. And um, a press release, an official press release, announced proudly that the partners had all signed up to all the rights and obligations. And significantly, it said the following. A new phase in the field of Copeam Asbu co-productions has therefore been achieved. Envisaging the broadcaster's essential and clear commitment to broadcast at least one third of the documentaries. In fact, it goes on, the quality of the products um, and their broadcast were the main goals of this second edition of the series distributed to the participating televisions by ASBU and COPEAM. So from that press release, I infer that not all programs were screened in the first series. And we also infer that the reason they weren't all screened had to do with issues of quality. Now, San Piero Sanguinetti, who's the um, Corsican executive producer of the series, focused on the production issues in an interview he gave at the project's first workshop in Tunis in uh, 2009. And I've listed the aims that he gives here. So first aim is, um, of the workshops is to make it easier to produce the films. Second aim is to make the documentaries look like a series and not just a random collection of films. And the third aim is to encourage a real collaboration and a real exchange of skills and competencies between the participants who are coming from very different countries and televisions. Do you see the word child mentioned anywhere in any of that? None of these aims is specifically about content for children. It's, it's about collaboration and content as such. <clears throat> Okay, we move on to the second um, set of data. Um, prizes, festivals, and training issues. And I've put the two main headings here. It might be a bit cryptic, entrance and circumstances. Let me explain. If you, okay, so if you don't co-produce, Another way of collaborating is through recognizing each other's work. 
through festivals, prizes, workshops, and so on. And we could mention in this, um, under this heading, we could mention the Cairo International uh, Film Festival for Children, which ran for 20 years, from 1990 to 2010. Um, <clears throat> was run, well, the main person on it was someone called Sohira Abdul Qadir, who told me that she was really taken with the Gifoni model. And if you know about Gifoni, the Italian Children's Film Festival, the special thing about it is that they have child jurors. You know, and that is quite significant because you'll, you'll often see that there's a children's film festival, but then who's doing the judging? It's grown-ups. Uh, on Gifoni, it's children um, jurors. But the, the Cairo International Film Festival <coughs> stopped after the revolution. And uh, Sohair Abdul Qadir described 2010-12 to me as a, as a kind of failed year. And subsequently, it has resumed, but it's kind of more of an arts festival, interactive arts festival now. Um, <clears throat> and I chose to focus here on entrance and circumstances because <clears throat> these kind of summarizes the issues that, that arise in relation to this form of collaboration. So the first point to make about entrance to four prizes or into festivals is that you don't get watched or rewarded unless you enter, yeah? And the number of entrants to film festivals to children across the Mediterranean is extremely low. Now, I <clears throat> collected the catalogues from that Cairo um, festival, including a photocopy of the very first one in, in 1990, and if we take 2009 as a random but like illustrative example, the only, I mean, there's plenty of films from Egypt, as you might expect, but the only other Arab Mediterranean countries represented are Tunisia with two films, Palestine with one film, and Morocco with one film. And that is against scores of films from China, India, South Korea, European countries, and so on. Now, if we look north of the Mediterranean and compare with the Prix Jeunesse, which you know the, Ger the German festival held in um, Munich every two years, um, if you compare, if you look in the Prix Jeunesse catalogues, you find a similar story. Um, <clears throat> the last event, the last Prix Jeunesse last year, um, looked back over 50 years. So the catalogue of that year is a very good place to count how many films had made it into the festival from Arab Mediterranean countries out of hundreds of films listed from all sources. I found five Egyptian films, three of them from the state broadcaster, the fourth was a four-minute preschool animation, and the fifth was made by a private Egyptian producer for a channel in the United Arab Emirates. There was one film from Jordan made by a private company, but it was for, for a higher age range for teenagers, and there was one from Palestine. Um, and the same number, the same issue of numbers also arises with the Goethe Institute's recent initiative in holding a science film festival for children, which they started off doing in several Asian countries and starting in 2013, they started the experiment in Arab Mediterranean, in Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine. And the aim of the festival, which started in Thailand, was precisely to stimulate film production. And that worked in Asia. Um, when the project started in these Arab countries in 2013, there was only one film entered from an Arab country. It was from Iraq, it wasn't about science, it couldn't be included. In 2014, which is when I spoke to the Goethe Institute people who were organizing it, they had entries from Al Jazeera Children's Channel, but that's the Gulf, so it's out of my Euromed uh, kind of geographical range and another from Lebanon. So maybe that shows the project is having some effect of stimulating 
you know, awareness and filmmaking and exchange. And maybe the festival achieves another objective, which I classify here under the heading identity, because often it turns out that children's media specialists don't know each other, even in their own countries. This is what the Goethe Institute people told me. So when you have an event like a festival, it brings those different um, groups together. But that's also where circumstances come in, yeah? Because in Palestine, if you are a media practitioner and you want to get together with other people in what you might call a children's television community, it's very hard because there are checkpoints and physical obstacles and so on, um, which I put under hardships, circumstances. Um, but then there's also, you know, no alternatives, by which I mean there's a lack of resources. So uh, Al-Quds Educational TV in Palestine shows programs that they get given free by foreign entities, um, even though they're not related to the local culture, and they're not necessarily what they would show from first choice, but it's free, it's high production values, it's watchable, and it fills the schedules. By circumstances also, we have to take account of political circumstances. And I note that the Goethe, Science, the Goethe Institute Science Film Festival, which happened in Alexandria in 2014, does not appear to have happened this year because the situation in Egypt is um, rather unfavorable. Am I okay for time? Another 10 minutes or so, yeah? Because we started late, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I put question mark here. You know, circumstances and hardships can also mean having your equipment wrecked. Um, in, in 2012, Prix Jeunesse and Goethe Institute together organized a three-day training workshop on children's news and documentaries in partnership with the um, Palestinian Institute of Modern Media. The trainer for the, pro for the workshop was the director of uh, children's news program, ZDF Logo. His name is Marcus Merchan. Now, on arriving at the Institute of Modern Media to give this workshop, he found that the Israeli army had attacked the site of the venue, and he wasn't sure if the workshop could take place. And in an article that you can find online about the workshop, he's, he ended by saying the following. Despite our three days of inspiring discussions and interesting points of view, the highly motivated and talented Palestinians came away knowing how limited they are in their possibilities, with little financial scope and even less freedom. Now, Fariel Awan, who's the uh, PhD student on our project about children's screen media, um, she corresponded with Merchan because she particularly focused on production uh, in Palestine. And in private correspondence with her, which she allowed me to quote to you, uh, he repeated his praise for the Palestinian producer's expertise. He told Fariel, they were real experts in that field. They had a clear view about what children know and what children don't know. In their films, which we watched together in the workshop, they tried to cover everyday pro problems of children in Palestine. The films they showed me had mostly good quality and had a good children's perspective. They were films with and for children and not about children like in many other countries. And we've already seen in the clip I showed you about Mahmoud that Ragdoll uh, Productions worked successfully with a Palestinian partner in the series What Makes Me Happy. But the circumstances for consolidating and developing Palestinian children's media are not favorable. And I have to mention here, it's not about Europe, but about um, Sesame Street, which was made with Palestinian partners. The funding for that was coming from USAID, and it stopped suddenly in 2012 um, from a decision of Congress. And the community of practitioners that had been 
built, you know, and developed and so on, had to be dispersed because there was no more funding for them. And probably the same difficulty of consolidating and developing is the case for children's uh, media producers in Egypt in the current climate. Because in Egypt currently, cooperating with a foreign NGO is potentially a crime, yeah, with a jail sentence. Now, I um, <clears throat> heard recently about a project to create an international news network for children, which is supposed to include Egypt. And the network is called Wadada. It's created by the Dutch group Free Press Unlimited. And they're working with an independent production company called Icon Media in Cairo. And the output is supposed to be broadcast by national state television on its satellite, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> satellite channel. And the program will be called iNews. <coughs> <coughs> but <coughs> notice what Free Press Unlimited wrote in its planning report for 2015. They said, developments in Egypt following the implementation of new NGO legislation as of November 2014 are so negative that we may need to examine alternative scenarios. Those Wadada broadcasts from Egypt were supposed to start in March this year. <clears throat> I think the training didn't take place till September and I need to follow up more about the current schedule. So sorry, this is work in progress, this bit of my data. Um, so let me just finish quickly by saying, I've, you know, I haven't yet mentioned Morocco, which is interesting because its state broadcaster is required by law to provide a certain amount of programming for children on TV, which is unusual in the region. And I think the only other um, <clears throat> country sim with similar requirement is Lebanon, but there, because of the kind of political situation, the requirement is ignored. Now, I've illustrated Euromed activities for children's media in Morocco through the example of Radio Jojo, which is based in Germany, uh, which worked in Morocco with funding from Anna Lindt and the German government. Now, <clears throat> I should disqualify this because it's radio, right? And I told you I was going to talk about screen media. Um, but it is a Euromed initiative, and it does highlight the potential for collaboration um, in Morocco. So Euromed Kids was a network um, for, uh, for schools and kindergartens who wanted to use media to facilitate a dialogues among children, especially under 15s. And the picture here shows um, Moroccans, uh, children in Morocco talking to um, school kids at the Radio Jojo headquarters in Germany, and some of these exchanges were later broadcast uh, by Moroccan State Radio. Now, <clears throat> my last uh, set of examples is uh, regulatory norms. Um, again, I'll just give you some like general issues, um, very summarized headings. I mentioned that Morocco is unusual in the region in requiring its state broadcaster to provide a certain number of hours of TV content for children. If children are going to get good stuff on screen, it's mostly up to adults to put it there. That is to say, you know, besides producing, rewarding, and so on, the other way to make sure it happens is by regulating. And countries on both sides of the Mediterranean have audiovisual regulators. On the Arab side, these are mostly ministries of information. So I'm not going to talk about them because they're an executive arm of government. But there are some exceptions. The regulators in Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, and Lebanon are at sufficient distance from government. They are just about considered independent enough to belong to the Mediterranean network of regulatory authorities, which I mentioned earlier. Um, now, you will see that I've in identified the remit of the regulators and the method of enforcing the regulations as key issues. And under the remit is the question of accountability. Um, 
Now, European regulatory bodies are generally accountable to parliaments, or at least they have a specific remit to protect the rights and responsibilities of free speech. In contrast, in the case of the Arab audiovisual regulators, even the ones I just mentioned, accountability is mostly upwards to the royal court or the government. Now, Tunisia's HICA, the Auto Autorité, whatever it is, H-A-I-C-A, was created with the right ideas. I think it's Auto Autorité Indépendant, <laughs> yes. Uh, the Communication Audiovisuelle, yeah. Um, it was created with the right ideas, but the government has sidelined it in recent decisions. The Jordanian and Moroccan commissions were initially both formed through royal decree, not acts of parliament, and their budgets and appointments are subject to control by the executive arm of government. And the Lebanese commission is actually attached to the Ministry of Information. So <clears throat> the, the next question is accountability for what? What do we mean by regulation? So I'm going to go to another slide and then come back to this one. I've divided um, approaches to regulation in a kind of dichotomous way in terms of positive and negative. Positive is about making things happen. Negative is about stopping things from happening. So positive regulation can include um, enshrining uh, in, if you, you know, when you give a license to a TV channel, you oblige it as part of the license produce, to produce a certain percentage of local content um, of which a certain percentage is for children. And in the US, actually, they have, um, they've, I mean, they do have some positive regulation to, which mandates educational content. Unfortunately, the broadcasters interpret it very loosely, but um, part of, uh, so on the positive side, if you are going to re make these requirements, these positive requirements, you have to monitor to make sure they're being adhered to, and that can be expensive. But mostly when people talk about uh, regulation, they're talking about the negative side, yeah? It's all about banning and blocking. So content bans, so it might be a ban on types of advertisement. Greece bans toy ads. UK bans advertisements for junk foods and sweet drinks. Um, you can ban advertising altogether for, you know, um, for under 12s at certain times or, you know, even in the US. I'm using the US. I say even the US because regulation is very minimal in the US. Mm -hmm. They limit the amount of advertising in children's programs. Uh, you have the idea of the watershed or safe harbor, which is, you know, is again like this, telling that this content is not for children, which may depend on a rating system again, which is saying this is not suitable. Um, and then you have the blocking device. So these are all kind of, you know, negative. Um, how do you enforce all this? Well, enforcement it's going to be, if you have, if we're talking cross-border, you know, Euromed collaboration, you have an issue of enforcement. Because in the European Union, you have regional coordination and the um, audiovisual um, uh, ag ag agreement across the, the region. In the Arab region, there have been attempts to coordinate, which thankfully haven't worked because the point of, that because the point of that Pan-Arab Satellite Charter was precisely to protect governments, not to serve the public. Now, we're coming to the end, I'm about to finish. Um, this is where the Mediterranean network of regulatory authorities comes in. And the expert is sitting in front of you, so I'm a bit nervous talking about this. When he, he is here, he's, I'm, um, but it's just very quick. I'm oh, sorry, I'm in the, on the wrong um, slide. Yes. Um, so the, the, this network, this Mediterranean network, provides a forum for discussing rules. They've issued a number of documents since 2008. 
that relate to audiovisual content for children. So in 2008, there was this declaration, and part two of it was all about protecting children and adolescents. And it was quite sort of specific and well thought through, making reference to the CRC, which is the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which actually has several uh, clauses that are media related, especially Article 17, which is about beneficial and suitable media for, for children. They talked about promoting locking me mechanisms. Um, they echoed the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child treaty body in saying that television should not trivialize consumption of harmful substances like tobacco and alcohol and drugs. They decried violence on TV and they said we need to promote children's education and human rights. And this was followed the next year by a declaration of intent. Declaration of intent concerning the protection of young publics and the fight against violence in the media. And that was against about like norms, you know, um, consensus on norms of warning about programs, informing parents about the alleged dangers of TV for children under three years old, which is quite a contentious subject, whether it is dangerous or not, and the launch of a Media Literacy Alliance. And then in 2010, there was a seminar on media literacy and protection of children. What I take from this history of where the Mediterranean network reached agreement was that it was all about the negative side of regulation and not so much about the positive side. So I conclude by saying, actually there are more observations than conclusions. And they arise from the issues and the examples discussed, bearing in mind that I was looking at this from the point of view of kind of an ecology, relationships, issues, actors. Um, but maybe these observations do have implications in terms of um, action and policy. So the first point is, um, I mean, you might disagree with me, but my feeling is that there is no single impediment to Euromed collaboration on the matter of children's screen content. But by the same token, there is no single solution. There's no one to blame, <coughs> and there's no one to congratulate. Um, the theoretical perspective of ecology helps us to see the dynamics of relationships and situations and ways of doing things. And it helps us to kind of uncover and reveal, you know, what some of the issues and examples are. The second point is that there is, um, it emerges that there is an imbalance in terms of the diversity of organizations that take an interest in children's content. Um, so if we look at the Arab side of the Mediterranean, there is much less diversity in the type of organization than there is on the European side. So state broadcasters in Egypt and Jordan have not been geared to progressive experimentation <coughs> because they're run bureaucratically with low pay scales and they're overstaffed with non-professionals. Which brings me to the third point, which is that the state broadcaster in Egypt for many years crowded out independent production companies. Now that may be changing, um, if the ERTU reforms and uses more independent production, <coughs> but we wait to see how Icon Media gets on with the Wadada Kids News Project. Where, the general, where my generalization about diversity of um, <coughs> production companies breaks down, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, it's too much talking, is in Palestine. So in Palestine, because of its history of resisting Israeli occupation, Palestinian civil society has historically had the possibility to grow, and with it you've had kind of uh, independent production, and you have groups there with expertise in the field of children's media, but they've simply not had the opportunities to consolidate and develop. The fourth point has to do with what we saw in the field of regulation. All the focus, I would say, has been on negative regulation, on protecting children from harm. 
What if discussions in the Mediterranean network extended to positive regulation? <coughs> so that the, the authorities in Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, put children on the regulatory map in terms of requiring local output of a certain standard. And then finally, last point to make, is that you can't help noticing what with pre Jeunesse, Goethe Institute, Radio Jojo, and so on, there is a, you know, German NGOs are very active in this field. Yes, Wadada is Dutch, and I could give you examples from Denmark's international media support, but I would say there can be plenty of room for more. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Sorry for going on so long.